For today's U.S. Supreme Court case, we bring our attention to Glacier versus International Teamsters. This case deals with unions and unions' ability to protest and say that they don't want to work and strike, and the union's responsibility for damages that occur during that strike. So the United States law protects unions and protects union rights under the Federal Labor Relations Act. And if there is a union, they might have the ability to strike. What if damages occur during that strike? Who is responsible for that? This case deals with that and as a result, somewhat changes the calculus for unions when they're considering striking. So let's learn a little bit more about this change in labor relation law and unions' abilities to protest wages and working conditions. Let's learn a little bit more about this. Glacier Northwest delivers concrete to customers in Washington state using trucks with rotating drums that prevent the concrete from hardening. I'm sure you've seen these trucks on the roads many times with their spinning, their spinning tumblers in the back, right? Keep the concrete in a nice liquid state so that it doesn't, you know, solidify in the truck and then it's ready to go and be poured when we get there. Fantastic. Concrete of course is perishable. And even concrete in a rotating drum will eventually harden, causing significant damage to the vehicle. So this merely delays the process of hardening by not letting it sit. But the liquid is, of course, coating the inside of the drum. And it will start to harden. And eventually, it will harden, given enough time. So we have to get it to the delivery site and out of the truck as fast as possible to avoid this from happening. The truck drivers in question, in this case, are members of a union. After a collective bargaining agreement between Glacier and the union expired, the union called for a work stoppage on a morning it knew the con company was in the midst of mixing substantial amounts of concrete, loading the batches into trucks, and making deliveries. All right, so the union over here has a bargaining agreement. They have a contract with their employer. Right, these, these contracts tend to run for a period of time and then expire, and they have to be renewed. That's typically how they work, although your mileage, of course, may vary. So they're in a negotiation relating to the contract between the union and the employer. The negotiations are breaking down, which is, of course, not uncommon. So they're like, okay, we're going to strike in response to this. When are we going to strike? We're going to strike on a day when the company really, really needs us, right, that will create an incentive for them to settle the strike faster because they really, really need us, right? So we're going to use our knowledge of the company to try to put their feet to the fire a little bit. All right, so that's what we're trying to do. The union directed drivers to ignore the company's instructions to finish deliveries in progress. We already have the trucks full of concrete. Please deliver them. No, we're not going to do that. Okay, at least 16 drivers who had already set out for deliveries returned with the trucks. We didn't do the delivery. By initiating the emergency maneuvers to offload concrete, the company prevents significant damage to trucks, but all the concrete mix that day hardened and became useless. So we were able to prevent most of the damage to the trucks, thankfully, but the concrete itself spoiled because it has already been mixed. It was going to harden. It was just a matter of time. The trucks helped delay that process, but don't stall it. So we were able to get most of the trucks back and the concrete out of the trucks, but the concrete itself spoiled and there was a lot of it. So there's a lot of expense in that because, you know, there's material in that stuff. The company over here sues the union for damages related to the product that is no longer usable, claiming that the union intentionally destroyed the company's concrete. And this conduct amounts to conversion and trespass to chattels. Conversion is the civil version of theft. Conversion is where you take someone else's property and deprive them of property. So that's what we're doing. And trespass to chattel is it was our stuff. You took our stuff. So similar theories, right? Conversion is you took it from us in a permanent way. Trespass is you took it from us in perhaps some sort of temporary way, but related theories of the tort. The union moved to dismiss the claim on the grounds that federal law preempts. So you're trying to sue us in state law for basic state-level torts, basic state-level stuff. But hey, this is a union activity. And as I mentioned, unions are protected by federal law.
So they say federal law preempts the issue. While federal law generally preempts state law when there is a conflict, the law requires that state law apply even when there's only, or rather that federal law apply even when there's only arguably a conflict. So federal law, of course, dominates this concern, as you would expect. The normal rule is that if there's a conflict, federal law wins. This particular federal law is a little bit more specific and says not only if there's an actual conflict, but even an arguable conflict. So the court doesn't necessarily need to find that there is, in fact, a conflict. In, in fact, only that there is some tension between the two, right? So normally in federal law, if there's merely tension between the two, we may very well resolve this in favor of state law because there's not preemption, right? We'd actually have to get into it. But this federal law says, don't even do that. If there's any potential conflict, federal law wins. Okay, fine. In the union's view, the federal law, which protects rights to self-organize, form, join, or assist labor unions, and to engage in others for the purpose of collective bargaining and mutual aid, at least arguably protects the driver's conduct, so state law lacks power. I mean, okay, that isn't completely illogical, given this rule, right? So we have a right to engage with others in our mutual aid relating to collective bargaining. This is related to collective bargaining, and we are doing this activity for the purpose of collective bargaining. So the idea that federal law preempts, given this language, is not wholly insane. So we're going to try to give that a shot. The Washington Supreme Court agreed with the union, reasoning that the relevant federal law relating to loss of concrete products was preempted because the loss was incidental to the strike. So the strike itself is protected. This is concerted activity for the purpose of bargaining. It's incidental to that purpose, so federal law preempts. So your remedy, if anywhere, is federal law and not in state law. So what does the Supreme Court say? Supreme Court disagrees, saying that the National Labor Relations Act does not preempt tort claims alleging intentional destruction of property. So whatever your union protected rights are when it comes to the mutual aid and activities in concert there too, does not include this. So you can go forward in state law. The union is responsible for damages under state law. The parties agree that the relevant federal law protects the right to strike, but the right is not absolute. The National Labor Relations Board has long taken the position, which the parties accept, the relevant law does not shield strikers who fail to take reasonable precautions to protect property from foreseeable aggravated and imminent danger due to sun cessation of work. So we already have some precedent on this issue. Yes, you are allowed to strike, but you're not allowed to strike in a way that causes damages to the property of the employer. So you have to strike in a way that isn't going to cause harm to the property and equipment of the employer. Given the undisputed limitation on the right to strike, the court holds the union has not met its burden as the party asserting preemption to demonstrate that the relevant law arguably protects the driver's conduct. Accepting the complaint's allegations is true because, of course, this was all in a motion to dismiss, so we don't know whether or not any of this is true yet because we didn't get that far. So assuming it's true, the union did not take a reasonable precaution to protect the property from imminent danger resulting from driver's sun cessation. The union knew the concrete was highly perishable, that lasts only for a limited time, and concrete left to harden would cause significant damage. So, you know, they are in the business of the concrete, so they have some knowledge when it comes to this. This is not a surprise to them. The union nevertheless, with this knowledge, coordinated with truck drivers to initiate the strike while it was in the midst of batching large quantities of concrete and delivering it to consumers. So according to the allegation, the union particularly chose a time when this effect would be maximized so rather than taking steps to mitigate harm, they took steps to aggravate harm to the company, presumably in an attempt to force the company's hand when it came to the bargaining. But either way, regardless of their motivations, they chose a time when the company and their damages would be particularly enriched rather than mitigated. So they didn't pick a time when like, there were, you know, we'll strike at midnight. They didn't do that. You know, it was like, we'll strike when all the trucks are already full. And you know that's, that's not quite fair to the company over here. 
The resulting harm to the equipment, because there was some, and the destruction of the concrete was both foreseeable and serious. The union thus failed to take reasonable caution precautions to protect against the foreseeable and imminent danger. So, you know, you are employed by your employer. You have a duty to your employer. So, while there is no general duty by general members of the general public, there is a duty in this situation because they are employed by the company. The nature of the duty comes in the form of the contractual obligation. By taking on the obligation to the employer, you have a duty to the employer. Now, of course, you also have rights unto yourself. So that duty is not, you know, completely all encompassing, but you do have some affirmative obligations that you took on voluntarily by contract. And one of those is to not cause purposeful harm to the employer, which you just did. So we can hold you responsible because in this situation, your failure to act assuming that's what this is, failure to act, right? We didn't do anything. We just simply walked off the job. Well, your failure to act can be held against you because you do have an affirmative duty because of your employment contract. So not so much with that defense. The union's efforts to resist the conclusion that the relevant law does not arguably protect its conduct is unavailing. First, the union emphasizes that protections of the right to strike should be interpreted generously. Okay. So we should have the right to strike for our collective bargaining rights, fine. But the right to strike is not absolute, and the court must analyze whether the right to strike exceed the limitations of the conduct. So yes, you do generally have the ability to stop working. You do have generally the ability to quit, but you have there's some obligation to not cause massive harm to your company while you're doing that. You know, especially when it was pre-planned out in advance to do it at this time. So we're not even in a situation where like a worker got completely fed up, you know, and this was the last straw. And they're like, I quit, right? Because you have a right to quit just as they have a right to fire you, right? This is the last straw, I'm leaving right now. Does an employee in that situation have a duty? Don't know, we're not trying to speak to this issue right now because maybe they have a right to quit. This isn't quite that situation because this was planned out in advance, right? We will strike exactly at this exact moment when, the, when it is exactly maximally harmful as opposed to some other time. And we will do it in concert together to even cause more harm. So does an employee have the right to literally quit at any moment, no matter what the, would happen to the employer? Don't know. Does a union have the right to, do, to quit or ba strike en masse in a way to purposefully cause harm to the employer en masse? No, that's a little bit much. Can't do that. Second, the union argues that workers do not forfeit their rights simply by commencing work stoppage when the loss of this product is foreseeable. But this case involves more than that. So they're like, okay, uh, we're not responsible if only problem is that some product gets spoiled. But there was more. Given the lifespan of concrete, the company could not batch it until a truck was ready to take it. So they can't make the concrete until the truck is available because once they start mixing it, the clock is running. So they only mix it when the trucks are available. By reporting for duty and pretending as though they would deliver it, the drivers induced the company to make the product. They wouldn't have done it if the trucks weren't available. You showed up pretending like you're ready to go and they started to make the product and we're like, we're not gonna deliver it. You know, okay, that's not really fair. Then they waited to walk off onto the job until the concrete was actually mixed and already in the trucks. Chose that maximum impact time. In doing so, they not only destroyed the concrete, but of course put the trucks themselves at risk because, you know, there's going to be some potential harm that way. Third, the Supreme Court acknowledges that the union's decision to initiate the strike during the workday and failure to give notice do not themselves render the conduct unproductive. So it isn't an issue that we stroke, we decide to strike while work was happening. It isn't an issue that we didn't give the employer notice. That isn't the problem, right? So is the employer entitled to notice? Not necessarily. Are they entitled to have you like strike on a weekend as opposed to a weekday? No, not necessarily. That's not the problem. There is a general right, of course, to stop and strike or stop and quit. So that's not the problem. 
Still, these actions are relevant considerations in evaluating whether strikers took reasonable precautions when the harm was imminent and the danger foreseeable. So it isn't that you quit during the middle of the day. It's that you quit in the middle of the day at a time you knew it would harm the company the most when the trucks were already loaded, when you showed up pretending like you were ready to load the trucks and ready to go. So that was the problem. Here are the union's choice to call a strike after deliveries had loaded the concrete in the truck strongly suggests they failed to take reasonable precautions to avoid foreseeable, aggravated, and imminent harm. Finally, while the union maintains the drivers took some steps to protect the trucks, the union concedes the relevant law does not arguably protect the actions if those actions pose a risk of harm. So yes, we did take some step steps to mitigate the harm, but the relevant law does not protect us if there is a risk of harm. So that the harm didn't necessarily occur is not necessarily the issue. The fact that we put things at risk knowingly and we're acting in a reckless way, the reckless nature of the conduct is a problem. You can't act recklessly, basically. Given that the company alleges the union took affirmative steps to endanger property rather than reasonably mitigate, the relevant law does not arguably protect the conduct. In an eight to one decision by the U.S. Supreme Court with Justice Jackson filing a dissenting opinion. Thus, that brings us to the end of this case of Glacier versus Teamsters, in which Glacier had a problem. They're a concrete mixing company. The Teamsters showed up with their trucks, purportedly ready to go for a large job, and the company was making very significant amounts of concrete that day, and there were a lot of trucks, and then the trucks got loaded, and then the drivers started driving, and then they're like, we're not going to finish our deliveries unless you meet our demands. Fortunately, the worst of the damages to the trucks was avoided. Unfortunately, all the concrete that was made was lost because it is a product that can only remain viable for a certain amount of time before it cures and all the concrete cured. So there was a loss of product as well as some equipment damage. The Supreme Court says that, yes, there's a right to strike. Yes, there's a right to quit your job. Yes, you have collective bargaining rights. But you can't do it in a way to deliberately inflict pain upon the employer in a way that causes harm to the employer. So you have to do this in a way that isn't trying to create massive harm. So you are responsible for damages, at least in this scenario. How far does this scenario go in terms of damages will have to be decided. But the basic thrust of it is that the union is responsible, at least for the foreseeable damages. And so that unions might be well incentivized to, for example, give the employer notice in advance that they're going to quit at a certain date, because then with that knowledge, presumably there would be no damages because the employer could mitigate their own risk or otherwise try, choose times to strike that will mitigate this law. So how this will be teased out in the future as it relates to union activity will have to be teased out. But for the moment, that brings us to the end of discussion of this case.